Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, at this Wu University webinar. Uh, tonight, we have the honor of having Dr. Matthew Lampa with us. Thank you so much for being here. And we're going to be talking about debunking custom soft lens myths. I'm super excited to learn uh, from you. And uh, I'm your host. I'm Dr. Elise Kramer. So a little bit about our speaker, um, Dr. Matthew Lampa received his Doctor of Optometry degree from Pacific University College of Optometry in Forest Grove, Oregon. After graduation, he completed a residency in cornea and contact lens at Pacific University College of Optometry. He is currently a professor at Pacific University College of Optometry, where he is involved with specialty contact lens fitting, contact lens instruction, and clinical research. He is also currently an associate in a private practice in Silverton, Oregon. Again. Thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Lampa, for being with us tonight. And um, all financial relationships have been mitigated. And take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Kramer. Um, so yeah, we are going to try to cover as many uh, topics related to custom soft lenses as uh, possible tonight. And in trying to keep with the theme, we'll try to debunk some of these maybe myths that seem to happen or try to at least demystify some of the challenges that exist um, because this can kind of get pretty overwhelming pretty pretty quickly. I do have to say that uh, for me personally, custom soft lenses end up being arguably one of my favorite, if not my favorite topics in, in contact lenses. And you might be kind of asking like soft contact lenses, like what else can there be said? So uh, we're going to try to cover as many of those sort of extra additional things related to custom soft lenses as possible during our time together tonight. And before we get too far, we do need to try to answer who is it that even is the person that we should consider putting into a custom soft contact lens. And those individuals, in my opinion, are really those individuals that kind of find themselves on this list before us. And this list for me is kind of separated out into two main groups. The first group of patients that find themselves on this list are those individuals that have something unique about their refractive error, particularly high minus needs, high plus needs, high cylinder needs, and or associated with it, there's something unique about the size and shape of their cornea potentially. Have a particularly large eye, particularly small eye, particularly flat eye, particularly steep eye. However, in this first group, if this individual has astigmatism, it's regular in nature. The other group of patients that find themselves on this list are those individuals that have irregular astigmatism left behind by either injury, surgery, or disease. And you might kind of ask yourself, irregular astigmatism and soft contact lenses don't necessarily go together in my mind's eye. And for now, and in the remaining future, um, those individuals that have irregular astigmatism, a non-flexing GP of some kind is going to be the sort of gold standard for the management of their irregular astigmatism. But there are things that we can do in terms of custom soft contact lens design and prescribing to help um, alleviate some of that irregular astigmatism that they have. And as time goes on, we'll kind of cover some of those topics towards the end of the presentation this evening. So I mentioned earlier that this, this topic can get kind of overwhelming pretty quick. And what I want to do is use this list here as kind of a bit of an outline for the rest of our time together, because in terms of custom soft contact lens design and prescribing, it's a little bit in my mind analogous to how we design corneal GPs or scleral contact lenses, because the design of the contact lens and the material are separate. We can design the contact lens one way, and then we have a series of different material choices that we can pair that design up with. Uh, again, just like we do in terms of corneal GPs and scleral lenses, which is unlike the sort of commodity molded style lenses that we get from the large manufacturers where the design of the contact lens and those parameters are sort of fixed, they're set, our hands are tied a little bit. So what I want to do is really focus in on those first three uh, because we need to satisfy that as a part of any contact lens prescription, base curve, diameter, uh, and then material, and then power, um, but then also kind of focus on the, the bonus categories on the sort of bottom portion there. 
Okay, well, anytime we kind of open ourselves up to a contact lens, really what we're trying to do is understand what are those anatomical features found underneath whatever diameter contact lens we're doing, and then how do those anatomical features control for the overall height of the eye. And in terms of soft contact lens design and prescribing, this was probably championed better than anyone, at least in my opinion, than uh, Dr. Graham Young from the UK. And what Dr. Young set out to do was try to understand what are those anatomical features found underneath the typical soft contact lens diameter, and then how do those features control for the height of the eye? And in terms of those corneal features, corneal radius, shape factor, and diameter, um, in terms of impact, it's actually the visible iris diameter that uh, has the greatest impact in terms of those three. Uh, the one that we measure the most in terms of contact lens design and prescribing, generally speaking, is corneal radius or central K value. What about the other two, the sort of ones on the far right-hand side of the graph, scleral radius and scleral shape factor? Really, implication here is there just isn't a lot of the contact lens that extends beyond the limbus onto the sclera. And so really, in terms of its you know physical fit profile, there's just really not a lot that we need to concern ourselves with. So let's see how these features relate to one another just to get our kind of sense of how this works. And in order to understand how one feature works, we have to keep the other feature fixed. And in this particular example here, we have two different corneal profiles with different central radius of curvatures. We're just going to vary the area over which those curvatures extend being the visible iris diameter. So we have the 40 and a quarter central curvature, and then the 4550. And as we steepen the cornea, we deepen the cornea. But again, in order to make that comparison fair, we have to keep the area over which that extends fixed. And in this case, it's fixed at a standard kind of visible iris diameter of 11.7 millimeters. Well, if we flip it around, look at it another way, uh, this particular example, we have two different corneal profiles, both with the same central radius of curvature. Now we're going to vary the area over which those two extend. And as we make the cornea larger, we're going to make the cornea deeper in that sense. Well, if corneal diameter matters so much, what's sort of average? What's the average visible iris diameter in the population? Well, this was a question that my mentors, um, gentlemen by the name of Mark Andre and Pat Caroline, asked themselves a number of years ago. And they said that irregardless of the reason why the patient was coming into the practice, they wanted to measure as accurately as possible the patient's visible iris diameter and then just see what happens. And just like so many things when we measure across the human population, we get this nice even bell curve distribution centered around one number. And that number in Mark and Pat's study was 11.8 millimeters in visible iris diameter. Well, this is a graph that the large commodity manufacturers are intimately aware of. And the reason why is they wanna satisfy as many patients, the sort of bulk of this graph with as few parameters as possible. Why is that? The way in which they manufacture contact lenses, in the end, they end up inventorying contact lenses. So as soon as you add a second base curve or a second diameter option, you instantly double the number of lenses you now need to keep in inventory. So they would love to satisfy the overwhelming majority of this graph with a single fixed base curve and a single fixed diameter. Implication for us in terms of the purposes of contact lens design, design and prescribing for tonight is if the patient seated in our chair finds themselves in the middle of the bell curve, excellent. Basically, you know, really anything's going to work out of our standard diagnostic fitting set. However, if the patient seated in our chair finds themselves at the ends of the bell curve, those are the patients that end up struggling the most with standard off-the-shelf soft contact lenses. And basically now we're kind of going down the path of considering putting them into custom soft contact lenses. But we thanked Mark and Pat for their study once upon a time. We wanted to effort to kind of repeat the study. So we used our favorite guinea pigs on the planet, optometry students, and tried to understand uh, what is the sort of standard visible iris diameter across the uh, optometry population. And just like in Mark and Pat's study from once upon a time, uh, we, we found that centered around that same number around 11.8 millimeters kind of visible iris diameter. The only difference here is we used a different instrument to do it. We actually used a topographer. And you see the designation there at the top being DVID. Uh, that first D stands for diagonal. So this is the diagonal visible iris diameter. And in doing so, arguably, you get a little bit truer sense of the patient's visible iris diameter because we know that the human cordia is a little bit longer horizontally and a little bit squished in the vertical meridian. So by taking it along the diagonal, you get a little bit of an average in, in doing that. 
Well, let's kind of flesh this out a little bit more carefully here and look at what happens in terms of the eye. So on our left, first patient example here, we have someone with a relatively speaking small visible iris diameter and associated with it a fairly steep central radius of curvature of 46 diopters. On the right-hand side, we have someone conversely who has a fairly large visible iris diameter, this time though associated with their corneal profile, they have a fairly flat central radius of curvature. Now this combination, this kind of smaller than average visible iris diameter having a steeper than average central corneal curvature is a fairly common association. Same can be said for the individual on the right. Those individuals that have a larger than normal visible iris diameter, generally speaking, have a flatter than normal corneal curvature, which isn't always true. The point here though, is if we were to draw our attention exclusively to the patient's central K value and use that as the sole justification for the physical fit choice of our contact lens, unfortunately, we would be grossly misled because it's not until we look at this patient in cross-section that we really start to understand that we need to take both of those parameters into consideration, visible iris diameter as, as well as their K values in the design and prescribing of our contact lenses. And these really are both the extremes. These are two patients that probably arguably should probably be fit into custom soft contact lenses. So in terms of passing this information on to the custom soft lens laboratory, it really would be ideal to give the central K value and the patient's visible iris diameter. In my opinion, the patients that's probably going to struggle the most in terms of the physical fit of the, if we were to just put an off the shelf contact lens on their eye is really the patient on the right. Those larger than normal visible iris diameters are generally speaking the patients that struggle the most in terms of the standard kind of off the shelf lenses and really the ones that we need to keep our eye out for in terms of custom soft contact lens design and prescribing. Well, what if we did that? What if we did that exercise just kind of blindly reaching into some diagnostic set applying the contact lens to the eye and using that kind of physical fit profile to tell us if the, if the patient's going to uh, struggle or not. And if we do that in this particular example, you see now on our left-hand side, you see that patient with a significantly larger than normal visible iris diameter, the contact lens just barely extends across the patient's limbus. And this is a contact lens that's probably going to move quite a bit, kind of have a lot of lid lens interaction, really isn't going to be all that stable with the blink. Their vision's probably going to vary. They're really not going to be all that comfortable. So well, what do we need to say in terms of the, the physical fit profile of a custom soft contact lens versus the off-the-shelf kind of molded style contact lens? Well, thankfully, those things that make the molded style contact lens look too flat are the exact same thing that make us custom soft contact lens too flat. Well, what about the too tight, the too steeply fitted contact lens? Those things that make the molded kind of off-the-shelf commodity style soft lens look too tight are the exact same thing that make the uh, custom soft lens look too tight. So we can just kind of skip right past this, really nothing more to say uh, than, than that. Well, what if we had our idyllic kind of perfect world where we could have this instrument in clinic that would take all of those anatomical features that um, are found underneath our contact lens diameter, the, the diameter that's the most ideal for the eye, and then that instrument would tell us what the sag of the eye is at that specified core diameter, would that arguably be the sort of holy grail in terms of custom soft contact lens design and prescribing? And, and maybe you could make the argument that that sounds like a good thing to do, Practically speaking, those instruments just aren't necessarily all that available in clinical practice. And this kind of adds a bit of a step, kind of a clunkiness. Um, and what we're trying to do is sort of demystify this as much as possible tonight. So, so what is it? What do we what do we need to do in kind of an in an understanding, a general kind of clinical sense to understand what's actually happening in terms of the physical fit profile of these contact lenses? Well, these are really the kind of sum total of, of those kind of five anatomical features that really end up controlling the height of the eye. And some of these are more easily accessible in terms of our clinical measuring devices. Some of it are a little bit more elusive, but if we kind of had to summarize this, the ones that are kind of the core essential ones we need to pay attention to is that central corneal curvature as well as the corneal diameter. But I do need to point out that number five kind of pointed, highlighted in blue, a lot of our research here at Pacific is pointing out that that's probably the most significant driver to the overall height of the eye, that peripheral corneal angle. We'll kind of talk about that here in just a little bit. So what about the other way? What if we, what if we had our ideal situation in terms of 
contact lenses? The would would we is there a way in which contact lens manufacturers maybe should be communicating with us beyond just simple base curve and diameter like they've done in the past? And and maybe we should make the argument that they should kind of print the sag of the contact lens right on the flat back of the contact lens. Well, maybe that sounds ideal, but at the moment, that's really not all that practical. There really aren't too many manufacturers out there around the world that actually provide us that information. So some good buddies of mine from the Netherlands, Dr. A. Van der Warp and Chris Smertz, set out to kind of answer some of those questions for us. They they tried to give us a little bit of a peek behind the curtain in terms of what are the sagittal height values of those commonly commercially available soft contact lenses. And I definitely thanked Af and Chris for this graph once upon a time because there's some very important um, clinical implications that we can take out of this. And, and for me, the first thing that I look at in terms of this graph that they provided was these are those kind of 10 commonly commercially available soft sort of two week and monthly lenses from the big four. And what my attention is drawn to is what are the ends of the graph? What's the shallowest contact lens and what's the deepest contact lens? Why is that? Because if the patient I have seated in the chair is, is of one of those extreme examples that I pointed out a few minutes ago, and let's say, for example, the patient I have is a fairly deep eye, and I use the contact lens that's all the way to the right-hand side of this particular chart, and that contact lens is still too flat. It's decentering significantly at temple direction. We really don't have excellent limbal coverage. As the patient looks up, the lens just slides right off their eye. Now I'm kind of going down the path of this patient probably arguably just won the right to wear a custom soft contact lens. How else do we use this graph? What if the patient comes into the office and they're wearing a contact lens that's pretty solidly in the middle of the graph here, and we think that that contact lens is too shallow, it's too it's too flat, what do we need to do? Well, we need to move to the right-hand side of the chart in an effort to fix that particular patient's physical fit. What other pieces of information can we pull out of this? Well, one of the things that you notice is there's a pretty solid line here between those spherical contact lenses to the left and the toric contact lenses to the right. Why is that? It has everything to do with the contact lens overall diameter and that those toric contact lenses having larger than average um, overall lens diameters end up making them a little bit deeper. Well, how do we use this in terms of clinical practice? If the patient that we have seated in our chair is, let's say, kind of on that borderline need of needing, say, three quarters of a diopter of cylinder correction at the plane of the cornea, we're kind of humming and hawing. Do we go equivalent sphere or maybe, maybe they're maybe better served with actually putting them in a toric soft contact lens. I would argue if that patient has that kind of slightly larger, maybe a little bit deeper eye, um, they're kind of struggling with the physical fit of the lens and they're on that borderline three quarters of adapter threshold of needing the sill, let's make the argument to maybe push them to the right-hand side of the chart to get the fit that we need, that deeper fit, that kind of better grip on the eye and the vision. What if the converse is true? What if the patient has that kind of shallower, smaller eye and we're kind of borderline, uh, do we put them in the equivalent sphere? Maybe we should put them in a toric. Maybe you'd make the argument that that patient should be kept in equivalent sphere, kind of have that shallower contact lens fit. Um, well, we kind of thanked Af and Chris for their study once upon a time. What we really wanted to do was expand the study to basically be every commonly commercial available soft lens off the shelf. And we reached out to a group in the UK headed by Dr. Ben Coldrick. And uh, this is the Optimec IS830, which is an OCT-based instrument which measures contact lenses in saline, sort of bathed in, in saline. And really the primary measurement that we're chasing here is what is the sagittal height of those commonly commercial available contact lenses. So if we were to draw a line, an imaginary line from one edge of the contact lens to the other, and then measure up from that line to the inside apex of the contact lens, that's the sort of primary measurement that we're after, the sort of posterior sag, if you will. And um, this is one of those images kind of taken right out of their IS830, the sort of OCT-based instrument here. You can see that sort of sagittal height profile of this particular contact lens. Well, these are those commonly commercial available soft one-day contact lenses. And um, what you start to see here is kind of a similar theme that we saw in Afe and Chris's study from Once Upon a Time. And really what we're trying to say is, 
what's the kind of deepest contact lens pegged all the way to the right. And if the patient that's seated in our chair still doesn't have the fit that we like, they just won the right to wear a custom soft contact lens. The, the same can be said for those lenses that are on the, the shallower end, the extreme shallow. Well, what if we have a patient that say they're wearing one of these lenses in the middle and we're kind of dissatisfied with their fit? How much do we need to change the physical fit of the contact lens by to actually appreciate a change with the slit lamp? And that number is 250 microns. So our research here at Pacific, as well as other institutions around the world, kind of echo that same number. Roughly 250 microns is what we need to do to jump from one contact lens to another in order to actually appreciate the change at the slit lamp in terms of physical fit. And it's the same number that the patient's actually able to appreciate a change in the comfort of the contact lens that they can actually truly tell but that one lens is different than another. Well, what about those reusable sort of spherical two-week and one-month lenses? These are those lenses from uh, the large commodity style manufacturers. And then what about those toric soft contact lenses? Well, you kind of see the, the overall grid, the overall chart kind of creep to the right just a little bit. Um, one of the things I find particularly helpful with this grid are what are those lenses that end up being fairly shallow uh, for that patient, for example, that we talked about earlier, who's needing the cylinder now, um, but maybe they have that shallower kind of smaller eye. What do we do for that individual that has one and a half, two, two and a half diopters of astigmatism, what are we going to do? Well, maybe you kind of make the argument that we should stay to the left-hand side of these toric uh, soft contact lenses here. Well, that's kind of nice to know what those soft contact lenses are, but what's the average across the population? What's the sort of sagittal height profile across the population. This was another study that we did here at Pacific. And one of the things I want to kind of draw your attention to initially is right in the middle of this particular graph, the, the chord of 14.2. Now, I do need to mention that this is the sagittal height profile of eyes taken at a chord of 14.2. Why is that? Why is that important? Well, if we think about those spherical lenses, generally speaking, we're going to have a chord overall diameter of the contact lens of around 14.2. Well, it shows that on average, those lenses are call it roughly 3,500 microns, sort of give or take, right? But the thing that's interesting to point out is there is a very broad range of profiles that's going to be seated in our chair here. So we have a very extreme uh, number. So if our patients average, excellent, we're going to have a great chance of fitting them off the shelf. If they're not, we're kind of headed towards putting them in that custom soft contact lens. Well, can we just use this number and go right off of the grid? Can we just pick this, call it 3,500 microns, and then choose a contact lens that's 3,500 microns? The answer is no. We're actually going to need to choose a contact lens that's intentionally deeper than their eye to get the grip on their eye that we appreciate. We're very used to doing this in terms of scleral contact lenses. We kind of take the height of the eye, and then we add some fit factor, some fudge factor to get the fit that we want. Exact same thing is true here in terms of soft contact lenses. Well, what's that number? That number is thankfully 250 microns, the same number that we need to change the physical fit by in order to appreciate the fit change at the slit lamp. So, so what do we do? If the patient that we have seated in our chair at a cord of 14.2 was average, let's just assume that they're average. Um, we're going to take that 3,500 microns and we're going to add 250 microns to it, which if we look at what are those commonly um, lenses made available from the big four, just solidly right in the middle of that chart that these big four kind of nailed it in that sense, right? That looks great kind of sits well with us. Well, what about the spherical kind of reusable two-week and one-month lenses? Well, again, solidly in the middle of the, of the graph here. Well, let's kind of take a look here at the chord of 14.2, sorry, 14.5, excuse me, and now draw our attention to the far right-hand side of the chart and, and pay attention to those toric soft contact lenses. Well, um, what you start to see is the, the, the graph kind of shift a little bit to the, to the left-hand side. And, and maybe arguably are, are those contact lenses on average that we're using for toric patients, um, are they maybe too tight? Are these lenses... Maybe or maybe maybe contact lens manufacturers are intentionally fitting them a little bit on the slug side to kind of lock the physical fit in to guarantee that we line up the sill with that patient's um, you know primary meridians. It's a great sort of great question, kind of food for thought. Um, 
Well, I think in terms of our purposes for this evening, keeping it with a theme of custom soft lenses, what do we need to keep in mind? And that is something that I pointed out a few moments ago, that though we have these averages at these certain different cord lengths, what we do need to recognize is there is a very broad range of sagittal high profiles across the human population. So uh, the point here is to kind of use the contact lens that's on their eye as the sort of OCT, to kind of use that as the common man's OCT, and then use that physical fit, whatever's happening on their eye, as the justification to kind of either move up and down those grids to change the physical fit profile, or maybe better said, to actually use, if we just can't fit them, to just jump right into a custom soft contact lens. Again, the patient just kind of won the right to wear a custom soft contact lens. Well, let's sort of flesh this out here a little bit, kind of add some life to this to see where this goes. And let's look at a case example. Now, um, am I advocating that all of us have these broad section anterior segment OCTs? Absolutely not. We're just doing this for illustrative purposes. This is more for research and this is more for kind of educational purposes. Um, I guess I'm kind of making the argument that we should really use the contact lens itself on the eye as the OCT and, and use that as the, the reason why we would change the physical fit of a contact lens one way or the other. But, but what do we have? What do we have before us here? So this patient uh, at a, has an, a visible IR standard of 12.3. So it's kind of one initial tip off that things are looking like this is a fairly deep eye or maybe gonna be a deep eye. In terms of peripheral corneal angles, a little bit on the steep side. So that kind of like I was talking about that driver as far as driving the height of the eye up as that peripheral corneal angle gets greater and greater and greater, it, it shoots the, the depth of the eye to be greater and greater and greater. So now we have kind of two things that were a little bit of a red flag kind of Oh, maybe we should pay attention to, to this eye be, maybe being a little bit deeper. And then this uh, patient at a cord of 14.2 has a sag of uh, 35.30, which is pretty average, right? That's pretty average, but we're going to have to pay attention to that VID and that peripheral corneal angle and see what ends up happening here in terms of um, the physical fit on their eye. Here's uh, their corneal topographies. You see K's off to the, off to the right-hand side. Well, I've kind of highlighted here the um, corneal diameter as well as that peripheral corneal angle being kind of our initial tip off that maybe this is not going to head down the path that we that we hope to. So, so let's go through it. Let's start out with with a lens that's sort of on the left hand side, the shallow side, um, more for kind of illustrative purposes. We weren't necessarily thinking that this lens would would work, but we just wanted to kind of go through this and see what happened. And, and also for illustrative purposes, what we did is we've dyed all of these contact lenses with lysamine green, just so that we can actually see what's actually happening on the eye. So with this particular contact lens, we see the lens is actually shallower than, than their eye is. Um, so now we're, we've ended up having a contact lens that's just grossly too flat. This is a contact lens that decenters really doesn't cover the limbus you could argue doesn't cover the inferior limbus at all. And as that patient gazes up, the lens is so flat, it literally just falls off of the surface of their cornea. So this is a non-dispensable product. We have to we have to move to the right-hand side of the chart. So let's do it. Let's kind of move in that kind of 250-ish microns to the right-hand side of the chart and see what happens with this next contact lens. We're looking a little bit better centered. I think hopefully you'd agree with me. This lens looks a little bit better centered. Still have a pretty significant amount of movement, but oops, on up gaze, that patient um, really we lose it. It just doesn't have enough grip to stay onto the eye. The lens just falls right off of their cornea. This is a contact lens that really isn't going to be all that stable. Probably is quite uncomfortable for the patient. So so let's keep moving. Let's move all the way this time to the very far right hand side of the chart and take a look at this particular contact lens on their eye. And things are starting to look better. We're losing some of that movement. Maybe you'd argue this is acceptable movement, but what happens in upgades, unfortunately that contact lens just falls right off of their eye. So this is a patient that basically kind of just won the right to wear a custom soft contact lens. And that's that's exactly what we elected to do. We um, kept that base curve a little bit on the sort of steeper end of the side, you know, not too steep, but also wanted to make sure that that visible iris diameter really, sorry, the contact lens diameter really respected their overall visible iris diameter. And we chose not to uh, dye this contact lens with lysamine green because this is the patient's actual final contact lens prescription. So I uh, didn't want to ruin uh, his, his contact lenses. So 
So these are those contact lenses sort of side by each. You can see on our left, we have the deepest lens available at the time on the market. And then uh, on our right-hand side, the final custom soft contact lens looking a whole lot better. Nice white quiet eye, um, providing much better comfort and much better stable vision. So, so is the sagittal height of the contact lens the only thing that affects the physical fit of the contact lens i'd be remiss if i said it was um it's definitely not uh, you could maybe argue it's one of those more significant drivers of the physical fit of the contact lens but we really do need to also additionally pay attention to the modulus of the contact lens in that the stiffness, uh, the, as the modulus of the contact lens goes up, its stiffness goes up. And really what that means in terms of us, in terms of our design and prescribing, is we need to be much more careful in those higher modulus contact lenses. As the stiffness of the contact lens goes up, it starts to approach that non-flexing nature like we get in a GP. And we do, there's just much less margin of error in terms of the physical fit. So as the modulus of the contact lens goes down, uh, the, the lens gets much more kind of flimsy in that sense and it's much more forgiving it lays over a much broader range of corneal profiles so anterior lens design matters uh, thickness matters hydration certainly matters to the movement of the contact lens so and then what about comfort is comfort exclusively driven by the sagittal depth of the contact lens as it relates to the sagittal depth of the eye the answer is no uh, it, it, it is a factor but i would uh, definitely be remiss again if it is if i argued that it was the sole factor so uh, that coefficient of friction or what sometimes referred to as lubricity just how slippery smooth the surface of the contact lens is is arguably one of the more um, important drivers to the comfort of a contact lens as well as the lens edge design protein deposition lipid deposition as you see unfortunately this patient's contact lens pretty coated with um, all kinds of things including um, makeup and then solution you know also factors into that as well in terms of the, the physical fit of, but sorry the comfort of the contact lens on on the eye what do we need to say here in terms of kind of nerding out here in terms of sagittal heights of, of contact lenses? Well, like I mentioned earlier, in order to see a change at the slit lamp, we do need to probably arguably move about 250 microns either side in terms of those um, those sag charts to be able to see a difference and then using those sag charts as the justification of maybe going equivalent sphere or intentionally putting the patient into the toric variation. And then what about multifocals? What, what, what matters there? Well, um, in terms of centration, some of the things that we've learned in terms of multifocal optics is we really do need to respect um, where that contact lens is positioned on the eye, that we make sure that we center those multifocal optics over the patient's visual axis and within their pupil. So using those sag charts to better center the contact lens, particularly when the contact lens moves in the temporal direction. Why is that? Well, as the contact lens gets flatter and flatter, relatively speaking, to the sagittal height of the eye, generally speaking, the contact lens is going to move in the temporal direction. Sometimes it'll move in the superior direction. So kind of respecting the physical fit of the contact lens as much as possible. If you can't get the lens to center, well, then that's probably the time to reach out to one of the custom soft lens labs and have them design for you a custom soft multifocal to best align those optics within their pupil and over their visual axis. What about piggybacking? Can we can we use this? Uh, I think this is just an awesome way to better fit our patients who have, you know, irregular astigmatism and just aren't comfortable in their corneal GP. So, you know, using this, um, these charts to help you, you know, design your piggybacks. And then also really, I, I can't tell you how many times I've custom designed patients for piggyback purposes, um, again, using these, using these charts. So and then also, if a patient, let's say, comes into your office, they're satisfied with the um, with the or excuse me, you're satisfied with the fit of the contact lens on their eye, but they're struggling with comfort. Um, you kind of look at the fit and you're like, gosh, I, I don't know. Things just look awesome from my perspective, but the patient's telling me they're uncomfortable. So instead of moving, you know, big jumps, 250 microns or so, just move, you know, one or two spaces over just to the that contact lens that they have on their eye, their, their neighbor. So you're not changing the fit very much, but you're putting them in a material that you feel is uh, superior. Or let's say the patient is satisfied with their contact lenses, but they want to change modalities. They want to move from 
modality of a monthly into a two week or a two week into a monthly or a daily or whatever it is, you know, kind of keeping the physical fit profile the same. So for those of you that have an interest in these charts, you're welcome to use this QR code on the left hand side of the screen to point your internet browser to the Pacific University website, and you're welcome to uh, download those charts and use them at your leisure in designing and prescribing um, lenses in your practice. What about the future? Will we see uh, some of these manufacturers actually print the SAG right on the flat pack of the contact lens? Maybe, maybe not. Um, we've kind of made the commitment here at Pacific to continue to evolve these charts as time goes on. So we'll try to update those charts as much as possible as new lenses enter the marketplace. Uh, will custom soft lens manufacturers provide us the SAG of the lens on their eye? And I think there's a possibility for that. Um, and then should we be maybe arguably kind of changing the diameter of the contact lens more than we change the base curve? I think maybe there's some merit to that as well. So, well, we've kind of covered the, the base curve and diameter. Let's keep clicking down our list here in terms of, um, let's check off the next one as far as material. What are those materials that we have available in terms of custom soft lenses? The majority of custom soft lenses in the United States are hydrogel, sort of HEMA in nature. Why is that? Well, HEMA plastics lend themselves very nicely to being cut on a lathe. Uh, they're also very stable in the vial. And then they're also uh, really quite wettable after they're cut on a lathe. Um, to lathe cut silicone hydrogel is a very difficult thing to do. Um, so though we have many molded lenses from the big four and others, in terms of silicone hydrogel lenses, we really have very few um, silicone hydrogel materials that are lathe cut. Why, why do I emphasize lathe cutting? Um, the overall majority of custom soft lenses are, are actually cut on a lathe, just like corneal GPs and scleral lenses. And then they go through a hydration process before they're shipped to us in the, in the final vial. So um, the, really the only lens material that's sort of used with any degree here is the definitive plastic in terms of uh, lathable silicon hydrogels from a U.S. perspective. So again, most of the lenses, lens materials that are available here in the U.S. are, are HEMA in, in nature. Okay, what about power? This ends up being the biggie. This is definitely the one that probably deserves the most uh, lip service because this is the, the number one reason why docs order custom soft lenses in the United States is, uh, is power mostly centered around astigmatism. So um, the advantages here in terms of astigmatism and custom soft lenses is, is there's a much broader range of cylinder powers that are made available. Most of the off-the-shelf uh, soft torics top out at two and a quarter. What percent of the population are we talking about? Well, it's in that kind of mid single digits. And you might kind of think like, well, that's not necessarily a really significant portion of my practice in terms of numbers. Personally, I would argue that it would be a significant portion of your practice in terms of those patients are usually the ones that struggle the most with contact lenses. And if you're the one to figure out why they're unsuccessful with contact lenses and you can get them to be successful in terms of custom soft lenses, you better make sure you like that patient first because they're about ready to be yours forever. So uh, jokingly, but in all seriousness, it's just a huge honor to have those patients come back year and year after year. I'm sure there's maybe a little bit of difficulty on the front end getting them to be successful, but once you get them to be successful, they just come back year after year after year and serve as in a bit of an annuity to your practice because those, those patients are kind of locked into your practice in terms of the exams, in terms of the materials, and then they uh, do just an awesome job job of talking to their friends and family, which is an additional honor to see their friends and family in terms of your practice. So, so building the practice off of these custom soft lenses has been just great in terms of, you know, my time here at the school as well as my time at the, um, at the private office. So what are we talking about in terms of custom soft lenses? It's kind of anything goes. Uh, you can specify if you really wanted to, the power in terms of tenths of diopters. Um, access to spine is a one degree increment. So if you really want to dial in their contact lens prescription, this is just an awesome way to do it. So when you perform that spheral cylindrical over fraction over the top of the soft contact lens and that calculator, whatever cross cylinder calculator you're using, if it spits out, you know, 
the the power just exactly to the tenth of the diopter and and the one degree increment. I guess if you really wanted to, you could pass that information on to the custom Softlens laboratory, and they could manufacture the lens for you that way. If you wanted to round up or down to the quarter, you're welcome to do that too. But I guess just know that in terms of vision, you can really dial in these these lenses really really well. What about presbyopia? What's the sort of motivation behind ordering a custom soft contact lens with um, multifocal? And I think a lot of docs start to reach for the custom soft multifocal when cylinder is needed, when we need that toric soft multifocal. And, and the other time is when just the stock kind of off the shelf multifocal doesn't work. And, and I kind of highlighted one of those reasons earlier, and that's his physical fit. And we get significant amounts of decentration. You know, what are we going to do in terms of fixing the patient? We, we have this kind of highly complex optic of the multifocal. And if we don't line it up exactly, you know, with the patient, no amount of over fraction or trialing, are we going to get the patient to be successful? So, and then also uh, really paying attention to the patient's pupil size. No, um, no multifocal presentation is complete until pupil size is mentioned. So I definitely got to mention that. But one of the things that's really unique in terms of custom multifocal prescribing is it's really only the custom multifocal that can actually respect the pupil size of um, the patient. So you can really design the contact lens around the patient's own unique pupil size in terms of custom soft multifocal prescribing. And then the other time is when they're intolerant to GPs. So what are those designs that we have available? Most of those contact lens designs that are multifocal in the marketplace are aspheric center near, which is a true statement for the off the shelf lens. It's just a true statement for the custom soft lens. Um, but we do need to mention that there are custom soft lenses that have that aspheric center distance design, which can be nice for that sort of low sort of emerging presbyope. Um, those that are particularly troubled by having the Aspericity in the in the center portion of the lens, you can flip it around, and then the other time, uh, as so much of the research has shown around the world in terms of uh, design and prescribing for children, that uh, there are those children that um, do seem to benefit in terms of uh, limiting the advancement of their myopia as time goes on by by considering designing and prescribing for them aspheric center distance lenses. And and I found so nicely that you can control very much the z distant zone size, the intermediate zone size, and you can control for the individual's astigmatism in doing that. So it's just a great way to custom design that myopia optic around what you believe is the most ideal add, the most ideal distant zone, most ideal intermediate zone, and then again, incorporating their astigmatism if they, if they have it. Like I said earlier, no, no, no presentation is complete without without um, considering pupil size. So yeah, if that's a parameter that you've measured, uh, feel free to pass that information on to the custom soft lens lab, and they can very much design and prescribe uh, that lens, assist you in in designing and prescribing the multifocal piece around that unique pupil size. Well, I kind of touched on it earlier. There seems to be this theme around soft lenses. If they decenter, they seem to decenter in the temporal direction. But what I haven't yet addressed is why. Why do if a soft lens decenters that it seems to decenter in the temporal direction? If we compare the overlap here nasally versus the temporal direction, we seem to have more overlap temporally than we do nasally. And and this theme seems to happen in scleral contact lenses as well. And and it's actually for the exact same reason. So. If we were to take um, someone's eye and look at their eye in cross section along the horizontal, and then if we were to sort of take a line, an imaginary line, and run it horizontally through the apex of the patient's cornea, and then measure down in the temporal direction versus the nasal direction at a set cord length, and then measure those two spots, do they line up in the same spot? And the answer is no, they don't. The nasal portion of our sclera is actually physically higher than it is temporally. Why is that important? Well, if we were to take a contact lens as identified as this blue arc that you see at the top hand side of the screen here, um, this is this is this is fictitious. This is made up in PowerPoint, but hopefully the the point here is made in just a moment. But this blue arc that we see at the top of the screen is intended to illustrate a 
typical soft contact lens diameter. But if we highlight the optical center, the geometric center of this contact lens with that yellow star, as we drop this contact lens down onto their eye, what you're gonna to start to appreciate, it's gonna hit nasally first and then get pushed in the area of least resistance, which in this case is the temporal direction. And now what you notice is the geometric center of the contact lens is now no longer coincident with the visual axis of the patient. And maybe is this why patients just aren't all that visually successful with contact lenses? Like no matter what you do in terms of the multifocality of the lens, can you get them to be successful? And what's actually potentially happening is they're not looking through the geometric center of the optics. They're not looking through the optical portion that you intend them to. One of the things that I have yet to mention is actually our visual axis, our line of sight is in the nasal direction. We actually look through a nasal portion of our cornea. So much of the literature that we have in refractive surgery uh, talks about this. And you might ask, why, why is it so common in refractive surgery literature? The reason why is the refractive surgeon has one shot to get the refractive procedure correct. We in contact lenses can just keep trialing contact lenses on and on and on. So we really haven't necessarily paid as much attention to this. But the other question we have to ask is why? why? Why do we look through a nasal portion of our cornea? The reason why is our phobia is actually in the temporal direction. So um, what we have to do is our eye actually looks out a little bit when we look straight ahead. We don't truly look straight ahead or actually our eye moves in the temporal direction. So we look through a nasal portion of our, of our cornea. So we have a couple of options. Option one is that we could actually take the contact lens and force it to, we could decenter it in the nasal direction. We could have some sort of fancy quadrant specific base curve on the back of the contact lens to get the whole contact lens to shift in the nasal direction. And that's, I guess, theoretically possible, but it's, it's a huge challenge. The other thing that we could think to do is just have the contact lens go where it's going to go. It's going to fit where it's going to fit. And then ask the manufacturer to very intentionally offset the optics, this time in the nasal direction. And I do need to mention, if this is going to happen, the contact lens manufacturer will need to prism ballast the contact lens to get it to orient so, um, so that the optics are uh, very much intentionally pushed in the nasal direction. And between the two, the sort of path of least resistance between these two is going to be to offset the optics. So um, that's something that we tried to investigate here at Pacific a few years back. And that's to say, is there a way that we can actually image this? Like, can, can we picture what the patient is actually experiencing visually? And thankfully, the answer is yes, because where these contact lens manufacturers place the multifocal optics is on the front side of the contact lens. So if we apply a multifocal contact lens to our patient, and then perform corneal topography right over the top of the contact lens, what we can actually start to see is a little bit of a picture of what the patient is seeing. And in this case, what we have up on top is, is a patient, just a, a patient example, right and left eye. This time though, what we've placed on them is a center distance aspheric multifocal optic. How do I know that? Well, I know that because the coolest color is in the middle here, the, the flattest spot, which would signify the most minus power. And the red, if you will, is that red ring of plus or the add, if you will, that's in the contact lens. And what we see here is when the patient fixates in the corneal topographer, when we ask them to look straight ahead, that's the zero point of the corneal topographer. Now, what's actually happening here is the contact lens itself is in the temporal direction, just like our fears came to be true in this particular example. Each one of these grid lines represents one millimeter in physical distance. So what we can actually say here is this contact lens is arguably almost two millimeters in the temporal direction beyond where it should be centered over their visual axis and within their pupil. So is this maybe why you put a patient in an aspheric center distance multifocal and they report back to you, hey doc, I can read my cell phone pretty well, but the distance acuity chart down there at the end of the room is really blurry. And you're like scratching your head like, what is going on? That's totally backwards. I don't understand what, that's not exactly at all what I was anticipating you to, to say. So then what we asked the manufacturer to do was keep everything about the contact lens the same, 
other than prism ballastant, and then this time offset the optic in the nasal direction. And really what you start to see here is that contact lens very much centered over their visual axis and within their pupil. And is this now kind of the best foot forward? Is this a contact lens that's potentially visually more successful, or at least the patient can trial it and hopefully be somewhat successful in your troubleshooting process? So what we try to do is answer that question, like, does it matter? Does it even move the needle? So uh, we worked with the great folks at the Michigan College of Optometry, Ferris State, and uh, they were able to recruit a total of 21 subjects who had uh, presbyopia. Um, 20 were able to complete this particular study. But what we set out to do was take this group of patients here, ranging from the ages of 40 to 65, you can see the kind of range of different refractive errors, and design two different contact lenses for the patient um, based off of their anatomical features. So K's, visible iris diameter, pupil size, their unique refractive error. And one group was to receive, sorry, excuse me, the entire group was to receive one contact lens that was in that standard form that, you know, just normal geometrically centered contact lens, everything was standard about it. And then the second set of contact lenses, everything was identical about it, except we were going to offset the optics in the nasal direction and then just ask the patient what happens. And they were tasked with looking at several distant distances, uh, different distances. We have email on the cell phone, magazine article, and then the um, words on the back of an eyedrop bottle. And the point here is as we go from left to right, the demand gets greater is, is kind of the idea. So what we have here is um, offsetting the optic one millimeter in the nasal direction versus zero offset. And in terms of logmar acuity, what actually ended up happening here is the green bars are those lenses that are one millimeter offset. The blue bars are those with zero offset, just the standard, you know, as it would come from a typical manufacturer. And what we see here is the lower the logmar acuity, the better the result. So, um, in terms of Snell and equivalent, this would be the lower the, the number, the better the Snell and acuity, if you will. And what we see here in terms of distance visual acuity, really not too much of a difference. Um, you can argue it's al almost the same. This is just a couple of letters better. It doesn't actually achieve a full line. Where you do start to see a pretty big break kind of a disparity here is in the near visual acuity. We really start to be, you know, more than a line of acuity of difference. Um, what about when asked? If we ask the patient, you know, what do you think in terms of your vision? Um, I should I should mention the patient is blinded to what lens they're in. They don't know the difference between these two products. Uh, they have no idea what what the difference is between the two. So, in terms of distance visual acuity, when asked, they really weren't able to tell the difference. You know, things look about the same. What about your near visual acuity? Okay, now things are really starting to make a difference. The patient can actually uh, perceive yes, this this lens this this lens that signifies and green that, that we know is the offset lens is actually truly better. But what about those near tasks? Magazine, yes, they're able to tell a difference. Email on the cell phone, even greater difference. And then eyedrop bottle, even greater difference. So the idea here is as the demand goes up, they're, uh, they're able to tell a greater difference. And, and for me, I think the greatest take-home message is um, when asked at the end of the study between all these subjects, which do you prefer? 19 of the 20 actually preferred uh, the offset optics. So pretty remarkable that they were they were able to, um, to do that. I see Dr. Kramer coming on here, which means we're getting close to time. I wanna end um, with this here, just kind of saying, hey, um, I encourage everyone to kind of reach out to their custom soft lens labs. Um, some of these labs are able to get you lenses in just a matter of a couple of days, which I think is in kind of debunking some of the myths around custom soft lenses that they would take, you know, six, eight weeks in length. Some of these labs can get you lenses in just a real, um, a real short order. And this is just an absolute wonderful way to build your practice, um, increase referrals, not only from patients, but from, you know, docs in the community. And again, kind of locks that patient into your, into your practice uh, in terms of um, materials as well as, as well as visits. So please feel free to, uh, to reach out. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to um, Dr. Kramer.